they exist. Allow us the time to vote and we can fix this broken immigration system and we can finally move on. Gracias a Casa Maryland, SEIU, everybody for allowing me to celebrate because you know, rights under the law. And one of the greatest things of this immigration movement is to see the role of women and the roles that they have taken in leadership positions on this issue. Today we celebrate 93 years del derecho del voto de la mujer y en 93 años vamos a celebrar el derecho de voto de los inmigrantes que estaban aquí protestando. <laughs> But it's not permanent. It, it, it can fluctuate at any moment. And so there are Haitians, Salvadorians, Hondurans. There are certain sectors. Look, there are Liberians that have been in this country for 25 years and we haven't settled. There's a large Somali community that still issues have not been settled. There are refugees from many parts of the world that are here legally in the United States and we need to settle once and for all so that they know with certainty what their future is. So I know that in the Senate there are some wonderful proposals in order to, uh, to quicken the pathway to green card for those with temporary protective status. I support that. I would hope that that would be in a bill in the House of Representatives. Now let me try to be very, very, very clear. We're going to fight and the first priority we have to have, because everywhere I go, so lo que me dicen la gente, para las deportaciones. Me dicen, Luis, ponme en un sitio seguro. They say, put me in a safe place. Protect me. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that any bill puts you in a safe place and protects you from deportation and gives you a road to citizenship. Now, it's not going to be the same road for everybody. And it's going to be hard, and it's going to be treacherous, but it's going to exist. My point is this. Look, I kind of think of it this way. If you get deported, it's almost like I've allowed you to die. Because the possibilities for me to give you a life in the United States become remote to none after you're deported. O sea, casi veo 1.200 muertes. Porque la posibilidad yo dar de vida después que tú eres deportado, después de la reforma, es bien remota. Así que mi primera responsabilidad, si tú estás enfermo, asegurar que tú vivas, de que, te, que suspires. Quizás no te tengo el mejor hospital, pero la medicina que tengo que te mantiene vivo te la voy a dar para que el día siguiente tú puedas luchar para mejor medicina. So we have to understand something. Si tú estás en una crisis, lo primero que yo tengo que hacer es protegerte. Y luego me voy a preocupar cómo te doy ropa, cómo te doy comida, cómo te doy albergue, ¿verdad? Pero lo primero que tengo que hacer es que sobreviva. Y eso tiene que ser algo que nosotros tenemos en nuestra reforma. Un sitio seguro que la gente pueda viajar, pueden trabajar, tienen su seguro social, pueden abrir cuentas bancarias, comprar su casa, tener una vida. Y después nosotros vamos a ampliar esos derechos. 
y va a haber camino a la ciudadanía. Va a ser distinta para distintas personas, pero lo primero. Así que la contestación es sí. First of all, the answer is yes. I think there should be considerations made to people who have been here legally for 10, 15, well, the Salvadorans has been since, what, 99, right? So it's a, we're going on 13, 14 years at that PS. I see the Salvadorian, he's always in the same hotel I stay in in Miami. I'm not going to tell the name. <laughs> El mismo. Y cada vez que yo llego, dice, ay, Gutiérrez, de nuevo llené el formulario. Yo dije, suerte que tiene un formulario que llenar. <laughs> que nosotros we're going to maintain that formulario. Muchos no tienen formulario. But I do think that we do need to give them an all sincerity. Let's take one more question, and then we'll wrap this up. Go ahead. Yo soy Jennifer, muchas gracias por estar representando a, a no solamente lo que es nuestra comunidad, sino también a las mujeres y a los niños y a las niñas de nuestra comunidad. Eh, me llamo Jessie Farouk, soy representante de Defensores al Derecho al Consumidor. Nosotros trabajamos muy duro apoyando a nuestra comunidad. Hemos ganado, hemos sido parte del Departamento de Justicia eh, en contra de los bancos de Tanchua y Sanchas, o es algo por discriminación, por eh, préstamos predatorios a los hispanos. So, hemos logrado que el Departamento de Justicia haga justicia por nosotros, por nuestra comunidad. Mi pregunta es algo que tenemos, uh, nos preguntamos casi cada día acerca de Obamacare. ¿Qué va a pasar? ¿Cuál es su opinión, representante, acerca de Obamacare y nosotros los hispanos? Porque ahora sabemos que a partir de octubre, cuando comienzan todas estas, eh, ya pueden comenzar las, eh, los intercambios, los exchanges. ¿Qué es lo que va a pasar si esta reforma no logra suceder con los hispanos que no van a tener socia y van a necesitar hacer un exchange? Well, I think that is that the, the question is what's going to happen to immigrants and Latinos when the exchanges open up, and particularly immigration reform in relationship to Obamacare. That's why I wanted to bring up what the Senate does. What the Senate does it says you can be you can go to an exchange, but there will be no subsidy. So basically, a health care plan without a subsidy is $11,000, $12,000, $13,000 a year. Now, for an immigrant family, that's going to make it impossible for them to really be part of the exchange. And if you can't be in an exchange, then you're going to have to rely on it through your employer. But here's what I, what I say. And you say, well, Luis, how can you accept that? Well, number one, it's already been adopted in the Senate, and we're in the majority there. It just shows you how difficult this is going to be. And so you can't expect where Democrats are in the majority, 54 of us, right? And where there was a willingness to get it done, to expect something better out of the House of Representatives, okay? Just from a purely ideological point of view, it's going to be more difficult. But here's what I'd say. Number one, once you legalize people, um, they get to get a job, right? Where there is health care. We know that the majority of people in America get their health care out through their employment, 80%. Well, they're going to have more opportunities to get employment. Their wages are going to increase, which means once their wages increase, uh, their ability to buy better food, to have a saner life, I mean, the stress that must be on those communities of people, the housing that they have to live in. So, look, their socioeconomic standards are going to improve. But they're going to have to rely on emergency care because that's what's been adopted in the Senate. Even though there's $175 billion, more than enough money saved, according to the CBO, instead of spending $45 billion over the next 10 years giving them health care, we spend $45 billion putting 20,000 more Border Patrol agents on the border. But those are the kinds of decisions we're going to make. I think they're difficult ones. Um, but I do believe that they're going to have more access. Now, each of the states are going to have to. What I believe is you're going, to, you're going to see states that are going to be friendlier. Illinois may be friendlier than other states. But what I do think is eventually they'll get there. They'll get to citizenship. The dreamers will get to citizenship quicker. Agricultural workers will get to citizenship quicker. I've seen that in the Senate bill. Those are positive things. The most positive thing is, look, they'll be legalized. They'll be, right now, they don't dare go to a hospital when they're sick because they think they might get deported. And let me just say that outside of clinics, 
there have been immigration agents doing raids. <laughs> so this is not something that, that, that this is not a fear that's unfounded. Let me say thank you to all of you. Someone asked me when I came in, what, what, what motivates you, right? What informs you? And I, I want to share with you a little something that informs me about immigration, about my own life, and then we'll, we'll kind of, we're going to wrap this up, but I'll talk to a few of you. I, I, I'm a son of migrants, right, from Puerto Rico. Vinieron de migrantes. No inmigrantes porque vinieron como ciudadanos. But my mom and dad, they came here the same way all of you came here, looking for a better future.